Today on Chimstock Africa, we bring you the first episode of what will be a regular feature on our show, and we will call this the State of the Nations. Today we go to South Sudan, where after almost five years of civil war that has displaced over four million people, the recent peace agreement has many hopeful that peace is finally returning. We will seek to understand what has happened, how the church has thrived in the midst of all of this, and what the Lord is doing in that nation. This is James Talk Africa. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Mogadishu to Dakar, this is Chim's Talk Africa. And now here's your host, Chim Onyibilanma. Recently, I went from South Africa with a team to Juba, the capital of South Sudan. We had come with food aids as relief for some of the thousands of eternally displaced households in refugee camps in that city. This outreach was in partnership with CBN Africa, City Hope Disaster Relief in Durban, as well as Capro Missions. Now, you might not know, but in the last few months, an agreement was signed between the opposing parties in South Sudan. I'm in Juba in South Sudan, which is the capital, and I'm at a place where aids are being distributed to internally displaced people. South Sudan is the worst US country after it gained independence from Sudan in 2011, after over 22 years of war, the longest in Africa. But soon after independence, in 2013, a civil war broke out. So this country of 12 million people has not known peace for a long time, until recently. The church in South Sudan has been in the forefront of the mediation that has brought about the recent peace. In October 2018, amidst overflowing joy, a peace ceremony was held in Juba. Today marks the end of the war. Why some are still skeptical, there are many who see God doing a new thing and that a new dawn has come. I spoke with Bishop Marwan Dangjong, the bishop of one of the largest Pentecostal churches in Juba in South Sudan and a military officer, a colonel in the South Sudanese army. Bishop Marwan Deda is a bishop of the Miracle Grand International Church here in Juba. Bishop is such an honor to have you on this program. Thank you so much. I'm also more honored to be here and uh, at least to talk about the situation of South Sudan. So for me, it's such a great honor to represent South Sudan. Thank you so much. Now, B the, the Bishop, you are a leader of a church. You are also in the military of South Sudan. Now, a lot of people watching from outside seem to think, what is going on in South Sudan? Since 2011, when South Sudan gained independence as a country, We've just been hearing of crisis after crisis. Can you help us in summary to capture what you think really is the problem? Thank you so much. Uh, this is such a wonderful question. In fact, it's a question that I've been asked everywhere I've been to. Uh, people, whenever you tell them you are a South Sudanese, they will immediately the first question, what is wrong with you people? Yeah. So people think that something is wrong with South Sudan. Yes. Now, from a Christian perspective, mm. uh, from a biblical context of the situation, there is actually nothing wrong with individuals as South Sudanese. There is everything wrong with the devil. Okay. So what is happening here is an or orchestrated attack from the power of hell okay. to destroy this nation. Of course, demons and all the devil, Lucifer, and all its demons, mm -hmm. they don't want peace. Mm -hmm. They are called to kill, to destroy, mm -hmm. and to disrupt, remove peace. Mm -hmm. So whatever is happening, uh, the devil does not walk uh, 
like separate from individual beings yes. it uses human bodies mm. to use them to work so what are the human factors behind just give us for the novice out there who might not understand really what the contention is all about uh, i think the human factor in it is lack of uh, goodwill okay like people they just lack of tolerance yeah uh, to be honest with you south sudanese even the Bible describes them as fierce people, mm. very tough people. Uh, so the human factor is that South Sudanese are, have less tolerance for one another. Okay. That's basically the main issue. So it creates an ethnic clash. Exactly. exactly. So the, 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 the way the devil has been working is just to create a, de a kind of an ethnic clash between the two. Uh, and suspicion between the different uh, yes, ethnic groups. Exactly. But uh, this has led to a lot of people being displaced. So tell us a bit about what of the things that South Sudanese have suffered as a consequence of all of these things that the devil is doing. I think, uh, apart from what is well known all over the world, that there is displacement you've talked about. Yes. But more than that, there is. Uh, cultural disintegration. Okay. Like the, the society of South Sudan has fragment fragmented. Okay. Uh, so people only know the Dinka and the Nuer. Yes. But which is the main two two groups we know. Okay. Exactly. But it is actually not only the Dinka and the Nuer. Okay. In fact, recently I came to know that there are even more than because what is known in the media is 64 tribes. Mm. But now the national dialogue which is done by the president, mm. try to bring people back together. They discover that there are actually more than almost 68 different tribes. So the devil has used this kind of uh, differences. Instead of bringing unity and diversity, mm. the devil used it to bring more diversity See, and more division, division and, division. and fragmentation. Of and, and Bishop, you know, this is what happens in most parts of Africa where many times it's the tribal lines that the devil uses to divide us a lot. That is right. And so it, it's, it's, it's like the soft spot in Africa. But how has it been for you as a pastor, Bishop, uh, to be able to hold people together? What are some of the challenges that now will go to? some of the answers God gave you. How have you been able to pastor in the midst of this crisis? Uh, to be honest with you, if it is not because of the grace of God, this is a situation that even personally, I've several times thought of quitting. Okay, because, why? Because even in the same church that God has given me to yeah. pastor, it becomes so difficult to see marriages from the different tribes. Okay. I did marry from Amadinka, but okay. I did not marry from the Dinka. Okay, you married from another tribe. From another tribe. That's so good. to encourage people to do that, it is so challenging. So it's becoming more and more difficult for people to marry across Very difficult. because of the suspicions. Yeah, because of uh, the way people view other tribes. Okay. The way they view it. Yes. So they view that every Dinka Mm. For example, because just have a dinka, yes, talking about yeah, dinka. Yes, yes. So I don't want to talk about other tribes. I understand, I understand, I understand yeah. But everybody thinks that if you are a dinka, mm. that means you are a backwards, mm. uh, you love having a lot of children, mm. you love having a lot of wives, mm. and not only the dinka does yes, that, but yeah. at least this is what yeah, most of the, the perception, the perception. That. Mm. So when you want to marry, mm. the first thing that if you are a dinka, they don't want. Mm. Number two, you want to rent a house. Mm. If you are a dinka, the people mm. will not give you a house yeah. to rent. Even if you have a lot of money. They because of the perception they have. So you're saying that as a pastor, you have found it difficult to bring people together in the midst of all of this because some of that has entered the church too. Exactly. But it seems that you have managed to create a cohesion as a church. A lot of the news we're hearing talks about how the church in South, in South Sudan has really helped in the peace process because just recently a peace agreement was signed which seems to be holding. Tell us a bit about what the church has been done, doing to influence this. Uh, to be honest with you, the church has done a lot. Mm -hmm. Without the church, even this current peace sign that was signed mm -hmm. wouldn't have been possible. Okay, tell it's, us a bit in detail what the church has done. In detail is that the church has gone into its knees mm -hmm. to pray. Okay. When uh, I remember the last, when because the negotiation was in different countries, but the main two countries were known is Khartoum and Ethiopia. Yes. But in Ethiopia, I remember there was a time when they were praying, they called the pastor to go mm. for the 
all the warring parties, yes. and when they were praying for them and encouraging them, mm. everybody was in tears. Okay. All the rebel groups and the warring parties. And these are not necessarily born again believers. They're not born again. They're just the leaders. They're just the different... leaders of different political parties. But because of the because kind of, of the power, anointing and the power that the exactly, power they pastors all brought went in tears. tears crying and believing that what they did is wrong. So God's spirit started to break down even the leaders. Yes. Could you say that's some of the reason why this peace could come together? It is not just some. It is the actual reason. Wow. Because it is because of the prayer. In fact, I, I don't want to just be brag and talk about our child, but every church in South Sudan, mm. they have been fasting and praying. For us, we have been doing a lot of 21 days, 40 days of fasting and prayer. Now, t tell me, as a man in the military, you're still in the military. I'm still in the military. So you're pastoring you're in the military, yes. and then the country was at war. How did you balance that? Uh, I've always been encouraged telling people that if you don't have the grace to handle both, you cannot make it. Mm. Because... Uh, when I joined the army, I wasn't in the army first. Mm -hmm. I received the award in uh, 1994, mm -hmm. and I've joined the army recently. Mm -hmm. So, but I joined it because I received a revelation from God. Mm -hmm. I didn't come with my notebook, mm -hmm. but I received the proper revelations from the book of uh, Romans. Okay. When Paul was writing and said that. Uh, that the current authorities are from God. Yes, in and Romans chapter 13. Yes, mm -hmm. so the current authorities are from, are from God. God. And they are placed there for our own good. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that we should not fear the... The man who has the rod or the sword. Exactly, yeah. because they are carrying the, the authority sword of God. As yeah. a, for a vengeance for yes. God. So yes. if you don't want to go get in a problem with them, you should bow you to good. the rules of the land. Yeah. So if you do good, you have nothing you to have fear. No problem. So what did that mean to you? For me, it meant like, because I was having this idea that mm. being a military is something bad. Yeah, and but that scripture I, was telling you it, it was part it of God's so, so that's how you went into the that's military. That's how I went. How have you been able to balance the two? Because here you have a country in conflict, you're in the military, which is the major part of the conflict, and you're a pastor. How have you been able to balance that? Yeah, as I, uh, I didn't finish what I was trying to say. I was trying to say that without a special grace for that, yes. you cannot do it. Yes. So for me, I felt God has given me the grace to balance the two. Mm. But I can't tell it has been easy. Yes. Even yes. when Paul said, uh, when he said he has a thorn in the flesh, yes. it wasn't easy. <laughs> he even cried and said, God did remove, remove me. it. And God, God said, said no. no. My grace is it's sufficient. So you. when it is weak, yeah, that's when the grace is sufficient. sufficient. So it has not been easy. Yeah. But the grace was sufficient. That's it wonderful. Is not that's easy wonderful. At all. Have you been able to bring some influence into the military? Too much. Uh, By the grace of God. Is there some. There is. Is there something you can tell us about it? I know there's a lot of sensitivity. Yeah, there. no, no, there is no sensitivity. Can tell us a bit about what God has the done. The reason there. I say there is no sensitivity because in the whole government, mm -hmm. everybody knows me as a pastor. Okay. And they also know me as, as a military officer. Yeah. So even when I go, mm. the example is that when there is any raid, you know what's a raid? Yeah. Yeah, when they want to raid a house yeah. or they want to raid a group of people. Yes, yes. Uh, the officers always try to look for someone who's so tough to yeah. carry the mission. Yes, yes. They always know that there are some missions they don't give it to me. Yes. They say this man is too much of a pastor. You so don't give you him. don't give him an so ugly they mission. Yes. Yeah. So they just have going. Yeah. But that's wonderful. That means because of your presence in these places, you're able to counter some of the ills exactly. that people do. So you are generally saying that uh, what God has used you to do is to be a salt exactly. and a light in the place. What do you see as the future? Because we're standing at a place where there's a lot of hope around. And some people are still afraid that maybe this thing will not hold. For you, what do you see as the future of South Sudan? I don't see any failure. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says that, let the weak say I'm strong, let the poor say I'm rich. So I don't believe in any failure. I believe that the only thing I know is that we have failed ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have failed the region. We have failed the world by leading our people into war. Okay. But that does not mean the past, no that's the past. That's the past. That's but the past. it doesn't mean we don't have a future. Mm -hmm. I believe our future is brighter than our past. Mm -hmm. Our tomorrow is greater than mm -hmm. our yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any failure. So for you, you you're filled with faith Too for the future of this great country. Yes. Uh, we're having to learn this here now. Sir, do you have a last word for Christians watching you in other places? Uh, I think the only thing that I can tell people is that we have gone 
ahead very far. Mm. But with all these good things that are happening, I want everybody that's listening to this broadcast, mm. all of you, I want you to increase some prayer support. Yeah. Raise some prayer support mm. because what is happening here? The good things mm. have come out of a prayer. Of prayer, and when it can only be sustained through prayer. prayer. So, so you are telling people out there that as you're hearing this, praise God for what is happening. Yes. Praise God for what is happening, but you know, use this opportunity to pray more. Yes. And let's see what God cannot do in South Sudan. So, so I'm really being blessed just hearing you and the fact yeah. of the place where God has placed you, both as a bishop as well as a military leader. Uh, may the Lord sustain you. We'll be looking at this space and trusting God for big transformation Amen. in this country. Thank you so much for coming so for the interview. God bless, God bless you. In the midst of the war and the intense suffering the church has passed through, the church in South Sudan has grown over the years. As we interacted with the people in the refugee camps, many said that beyond the food we brought, their greatest need is the word of God. Of the 77 ethnic groups in South Sudan, only seven remain unreached with the gospel. I sense a deep spiritual hunger everywhere and I feel that now is the time to bring the word of God here, both to restore the souls of the many true Christians, win the thousands of nominal Christians and reach the remaining unevangelized peoples of South Sudan. I was impressed by the labors of faithful church leaders who in the midst of the crisis have continued to shepherd their flock, even when the outbreak of war had meant that they were scattered into so many locations. Bishop Matthew Peter is one of such shepherds. In the years since the crisis scattered the pastors and the churches under him to places as far as Uganda, he has taken it upon himself to travel around to continue to minister to them. I have with me Bishop Matthew Peter. He's the bishop of the Wonduruba uh, Diocese in South Sudan of the Episcopal Church. Uh, bishop, you're welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, uh, the, uh, Bishop, I brought you here because I heard you talking recently about what your people went through during the crisis that came up on South Sudan. Can you capture a bit? First of all, can you tell us where your diocese is? Thank you, Sam. Um, my diocese, or our diocese, is um, 81 miles west of uh, the capital city of Juba. The, 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 the area we had a disputed um, a, uh, census which was conducted before the independence. And then the population was estimated to be over 60,000. 60,000. Yeah. Now, you were saying that during the first crisis that happened, the, the war that happened in 2013, that it didn't touch that area, that your area was pr practically at peace. But in 2015, about uh, a few years ago, when the second wave of war happened, it affected your people. Can you take us through what happened in 2015 and how it affected your people? You know, this incident, as I said, it happened in, the, in September 2015. It found me in the, in the diocese. It was just in the morning hours. Normally we have devotions, in the morning devotions, every day except this uh, Saturday. And then we wait for the, more, I mean, the main service on Sunday. So I went for morning a devotion that particular day, uh, September 15th, uh, 2015. Uh, then we heard that there was some crisis about 18 miles from the cathedral center. And then we were seeing people fleeing. I had to remain in finding out what actually happened and then immediately became visible. And then it was audible that uh, at around 11, we were able to now hear the heavy guns and the sellings going around. Then we indicated that, I mean, we knew that there was actually some real fighting going on. People were running away until I was advised to leave um, on Ruba Center, the cathedral, at around 4.30 and then drop uh, southwest to a uh, nearby diocese of Lanya or the Lanya County, which is about 18 miles. That's what happened. Mm. Yeah, and then uh, on my way, I was uh, seeing people, uh, different uh, walks of life. In the old, the young, people were just walking. It was a very traumatizing moment. I could not even hold my tears because when I saw elders, mm. children, you know, at the back, you know, lactating mothers, Mm. We are just going with a few luggages, a few belongings, running for their lives. Running for their lives. Some people it, were killed. I didn't see that moment. Mm. There was no, 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 no death on the spot. Mm. And then um, I had to return after seven days. Mm. I came back mm. to Nduruba with the team that the government composed to go and they make investigations. Immediately I discovered that there was actually uh, a lot of destructions okay. in, the, in, the town, in the town. Shops were all destroyed. 
people, I mean, things were looted. That was the beginning. Mm. Yeah. You, you talked about that presently your, your people can be dis found in four different areas, like, like this. The, the, like where we are right now is uh, the area where the IDP for the Wondruba uh, refugees are found in Juba, but you said they're in other places. So what I want to find out with your people scattered, some in the, in the bush, some in Juba, some have gone to Uganda. How have you managed to pastor uh, a group like that that are scattered, people who are far from your home, how have you managed to pastor them and shepherd them? Yeah, great. Before I come to the issue of pastoring, I have to make it very clear, clear so that the listeners and you also understand. Truly, the, my people, my flock were uh, divided into almost four zones. The first one you mentioned, the majority are actually in the, in the, in the in buses. In the buses, uh, not accessible. The roads are not accessible to them. They are in the mountains, living in a situation of, uh, you know, no schools, no potable water, and no communication. Uh, that one, uh, to, to me, it becomes a problem. Some of the pastors who uh, join that group, I'm not able to, connect, to communicate with them. Okay. And that's the majority of the population. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a thin population which is in the government control areas along uh, the town, uh, main centers of uh, Mundruba, where the commissioner is, where my cathedral is. And then uh, Mengele, Ketigiri, it, uh, a, a very thin population. That's the second uh, category of the displaced uh, people or who are actually in the, in the, uh, as a host community. Then the third one, I'm glad you have seen for yourself, mm. these are the group that are in the major towns. Like uh, Juba. Like Juba. There's one um, group also, the same like the one in Juba, they are in Ye. These are major two towns where my people have been uh, displaced. Mm. And um, these people are actually commuting with friends and relatives. There's no organized camp. There's no place for them to be received by any organization. They are just being taken care of by their friends, relatives in a limited space, very difficult conditions economically. You know, water in Juba is a, it's a bit difficult to assess mm -hmm. even. You have to buy a bottle of water costing uh, 400 pounds. If you rate that, mm -hmm. it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is not easy to get. Then the last group, as you mentioned, it is um, those who have managed to go to Kakuma in Kenya. Okay. Those who are able outside to... The country, yeah, outside, outside of as refugees now. Mm. These are not IDPs. Mm. These are refugees. Mm. Uh, they are in Kenya, they are in Uganda, and some of them have walked in the bushes, you know, mm. to go to Congo. Okay. You know, to Congo. So you're talking about four different areas. Four different people. How That's have you managed to shepherd them? What yeah. has been the strategy? Going it has been you? my privilege uh, that those who are here, because I've been settling between Ondruba and here, I have to be with them in all situations, sometimes in the funerals, you know, in the, in, in, in the church service. I have to visit them in the house individually where they are. Sometimes I take really time to visit, walking on foot with all this heat of Juba to find out, pray with them, counsel them, you know, give them encouragement that God will never abandon them. In their distress, in their sufferings, God is always with them. And I think it has been, a, you know, a, a privilege for me to be with them. And sometimes even I have nothing to offer to them. But my presence, you know, gives them, encourages them. them. I actually like the way you carry the people in, in your heart. I've watched you interacting with the people, and uh, it seems that even though they're all scattered, you have managed to put them in your heart and shepherd them in the midst of this crisis. Tell me, right now, there's an expectation that peace is coming back to South Sudan. In your view, is this, is this what is going on? Great. And I um, also have to, to mention to you that yeah, eventually, People who have been displaced and are in, in, the, in the displaced place like Juba, some of them have decided to go back voluntarily. Okay. They have decided to return. When they hear there's a bit of tranquility, okay. there's a bit of um, peace, there's no harassment uh, in the situation. Mm. Some of them have compared notes. And then when they see the situation in Juba compared to what they have left at the back mm. of their villages, they have walked back. Mm. And um, now with the, uh, with the essence of peace, and we do uh, thank God, that uh, peace is signed. Mm -hmm. And our prayer is that let this peace be implemented. Okay. If it is implemented, I think that will be the great dividend for my people uh, that we shall be able to, you know, to, to go back and resettle and reconstruct those things which have been destroyed, those things which have been uh, demolished. Uh, I think that's the great hope, that in once fact, peace is there, then everything will be okay. 
in fact, as you go around, it seems that's the same prayer point everybody is giving. That yeah. they want to see peace so that they can go back to their normal life. A last question: Would you think that the faith of people have grown through this crisis? Have they grown stronger? Do you think there is a lesson that Christians can learn through what has happened? See, I'm telling you, I think this crisis has brought people nearer to God. Okay. Nearer to God because without God, you can imagine people have nothing. They have no penny, but they are living. How? It's because of the providence of the Lord, God. of God. And then, for instance, if you, you just tally it with your presence, people from far, mm. you know, pray for them, You're visit about them. The intervention of intervention. Africa. Yes, okay. for instance, mm. you come to them, console them, pray with them. I think uh, they realize that without God, they would not exist. Mm. So they have come nearer to God during this crisis. People have become very strong. So in the midst of the trial, they've experienced God and they've become stronger in their faith. So what the devil planned for bad, somehow God is working in the church of South Sudan to make the people stronger. Yes, and the devil has failed. Amen. The devil has failed. Amen. The devil has Amen. failed. Thank you so much uh, for just sharing with us your experience. I'm sure that the viewers will add this to their prayers. What we know, like you said, is that South Sudan belongs to Jesus. And what the devil planned for evil... The Lord will always turn for good. Bishop, thank you so thank much you for the time. Thank you. Uh, we are, we are, we are, we are. One thing that caught my attention is how much Muslim humanitarian groups are present in the refugee camps we visited. In one of them, they had built boreholes, schools, including a university satellite center for the people. Even with the dawn of peace, the people of South Sudan are in urgent need of our help. Our missionaries on the ground estimate that for the next two years, millions will need a lot of aid from outside before they can find their feet after years of complete devastation. There is an open door for churches from all across Africa to invest in South Sudan. And I'm making this call because I believe God is making this call. They need food, schools, help to learn profitable skills to get back into their lives and source of clean water, for example. Above all, they need the gospel. It will be tragic if we let these people to become Islamized because of their desperate need. If you'd like to support our effort in rebuilding South Sudan, please contact us today. Your contribution can make a huge difference. Welcome back. God is at work in South Sudan and doing a new thing. I trust that you'll get involved today. Now, I find the prophecy in Psalm 110 very exciting. In verse 1, it says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. God's goal is making his enemies his footstool. It's war. Satan holds the nation in bondage, and God is determined to bring Satan to his knees and to make him his footstool. What we often call missions or evangelism or global evangelism or reaching the unreached nations is the process of making God's enemies his footstools. The devil has usurped authority and is holding nations in captivity. God wants to make them bow to him. Isn't it interesting in this verse that God says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Does one sit to war? Now, the reason God is saying to Christ to sit be is because Christ has finished the work of conquering the devil on the cross. What is left is for the enforcement of that finished work. That's why we read in verse 2 of this chapter, it says, The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Zion is the church. The church is God's only instrument for conquering the rule of Satan in the nations. God has no plan B. And you and I who follow Christ, we are the ones that God wants to send to the nations to enforce the lordship of Christ and make his enemies his footstool by liberating souls from hell. Angels won't do it. That's why he prophesied here in verse 3, Your troops will be ready on the day of party. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like the morning dew. I believe that we are living in the days of the fulfillment of this prophecy. God is raising an army of willing people who will put his kingdom first before their comfort and will be prepared to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. Are you one of this? Contact us on the numbers of the screen if you feel God is calling you to go. Thanks for joining me this week and I'll see you next week. 
Bye bye. My guest next week is Sam Utu, whose mission, Capro, is helping to take the gospel to the millions of people yet to hear it. Next week on Chimps Talk. This program is made possible by the generous financial support of believers just like you, who share our heart to equip the African church to engage the issues facing our continent. Your financial support will help us continue this important work. If you feel led to give to this ministry, please visit our website today. Thank you.